Is there a universal best method for sizing brass or setting neck tension in 223 Remington? What makes it the best? Would you switch out your sizing dies if you thought the groups you fired would be smaller or the extreme spreads would be lower for the life of your die? I know I would. I got inspired from one of Johnny Reloading Bench's videos on 223 sizing dies and decided to see if we could find out why one method would perform better than another and more importantly, why that was. You guys certainly have your opinions on why your way is the best and if you're happy with your performance, I certainly don't care if you change. But today we're on a mission to try and understand why it seems that some combinations just seem to work better than others. During today's test, we're going to explore 17 different configurations to look at trends in our results to see if there's any indication that one method is clearly better than another. Put on your Blues Brothers, we're on a Mission from God t-shirt, and let's get started. Now first, understanding what better really means is important. I asked you guys a little while back what your biggest reloading goals were. Over 50% of you wanted to shrink your groups, and only 13% your main goal was to lower your extreme spread and standard deviations. These goals frankly make sense, because unless you shoot every round over a chronograph, it's easier to improve what you can measure. When it comes to your extreme spreads and standard deviations, powder, primer, and case consistency I think really come into play, and setting realistic goals is important. When starting out reloading for a new caliber, I don't care what caliber I'm loading for, the first bar I set is beating factory ammo. This really shouldn't be terribly difficult and really not require any special tools. I don't even think you're going to have to anneal or anything like that. In my 223 versus 556 comparison of factory ammo, we cast a wide net and tested 10 different rounds of 10 different factory offerings in 55 grains all the way to 75 grains. Accuracy and velocity performance was all over the place. The extreme spreads varied from 66 all the way to almost 100 feet per second, while accuracy went from somewhere around 1.24 MOA all the way to well over 4 MOA for some of our groups. If we chose which one of these offerings was the best, and we were looking only at standard deviation, that MFS 55 grains would be our choice, but at over 4 MOA, it's something I clearly would not want, and most of us would gladly sacrifice 11 feet per second of extreme spread to shrink our groups by so much. Now clearly, I don't expect anyone to do all this crazy testing, but when we started out with the 77 grain Sierra Match King, we tested 10 different powders to see what types of velocities we could achieve, starting somewhere in the middle of the low charge range, testing all the way to max on all 10 powders. Out of all those powders, I picked AR Comp to do some further work with, and we decided to test that powder behind nine separate primers. We found out that among others, the CCI 41 responded fairly consistently, so we picked this combo to do our testing with today. For our load details today, we're using once fired Hornady Frontier Brass, it has been annealed, we're using the CCI 41 primer, we're using 21.5 grains of AR comp, and the good old 77 grain Sierra Match King. Our cartridge overall length we're loading to is 2.255 inches for reliable magazine feeding. And we're testing 17 different methods to size the brass. And we're not going to be using a crimp for any of today's configurations. One important consideration is that we're only using 5 shot groups. 10 would be far better, but these sample sizes tend to get crazy pretty fast. All of our group data also assumes no effect from the shooter, so good luck controlling that variable, but I did do my best. When Johnny's Reloading Bench did his 223 die comparison, he tested five different configurations. A standard Lee, a standard Redding, the Mighty Armory die, the Mighty Armory die with a 21st century expander mandrel, and the Mighty Armory with a K&M expander mandrel. Both expander mandrels he used were .222 inches, and that won't be much different for us today because the only 22 caliber I have on hand at the moment is from Sinclair and it measured out at exactly the same 0.222 inches. But I think I may need to pick up some more options and if you stick around to the end of the video, I'll explain why. So today we went full ridiculous and tested 17 total configurations. Three factory dies in their standard configuration. Those same three dies removing the stock expander mandrel and then using the 222 expander mandrel from Sinclair. Our other options, we took a Redding 223S die and tried 11 different configurations with it. If it's not apparent, we're trying to cast a wide net and then maybe narrow it down a little bit to test less configurations and more samples at those configurations. I am fully aware that comparing 5 shot groups to a 10 shot group isn't exactly fair, but again, we're casting a wide net. Today I was very encouraged that all the configurations we tested beat our factory performance. Our best factory option had a standard deviation of 18.3 and an extreme spread of 66, while our worst configuration today had a standard deviation of 16.9 and an extreme spread of 43. Our worst groups with our Forester die with or without the expander mandrel, and that performance is still better than our best factory option, but again, the sample size isn't really fair. Our best group for the day was with a Redding S die with a Short Action Customs 246 bushing at 0.25 MOA which was by far not just the best group for today, but the best I've ever achieved out of this platform to date. 
I still consider this load to be untuned as we haven't done anything with cartridge roll length testing. It's just loaded at 2.255 inches for easy magazine feeding. But some very curious results as we look at the velocity data. The lowest extreme spread in standard deviations were mostly with our factory dies with the stock expanders included. In the three cases where we used expander mandrels, the groups were the same or improved. However, the extreme spread opened up in pretty much every single case. If we were using a premium brass, I think we would have had better results, but I don't think a ton of guys are feeding Lapo brass through this style of platform. Maybe I'm wrong. After seeing the performance of the standard deviation and extreme spread as the factory offerings, I've asked you guys what your expectations were for 223 Remington, and the greater majority of you said we're happy with a standard deviation of less than 10 feet per second. Clearly, some of the combinations we tested today meet this criteria. After seeing that the factory dies with the stock expanders generally have lower standard deviations compared to the other configurations we tested, I'm asking myself why that might be the case. After I saw these results, I went back and measured the expanders in all of our different configurations for our standard dies. The Forester's expander was 0.223 inches, the RCBS was 0.226 inches, the Lee was 0.2275 inches, and the Reading was identical to the RCBS at 0.226 inches. This is really a situation where I appreciate having the micrometer because I don't think we'd be able to see it if we were just measuring it with calipers. Now our expander mandrel is the exact 0.222 inches that we thought it was. But would we have seen better results if we'd used a slightly larger expander mandrel? Certainly something I think that needs tested. The other configuration that I thought was interesting is when we used our Reading s die with the 243 bushing, but used its stock expander. Not only did it shrink the groups, but it also lowered the standard deviations and extreme spread. Clearly, the bushing by itself did nothing to help this combination. Another variable that I think is worth looking at is the runout of all these different configurations. If the only variable you were going to concentrate on was runout, the Short Action Customs bushings are hard to beat. It is consistently the lowest of all the combinations tested. I'm sure there's plenty to argue about with this data. Testing some additional configurations with different expander mandrels, as well as testing some of the bushing configurations with an expander mandrel, may bring to light some more interesting details. But if you're wondering what powder might give you the best performance in 223 Remington, check out this video right here. And until next week, stay safe in small groups.